At this point, I would like to introduce Rav Neni Evan Yisrael to start our learning. <coughs> Rav Neni is uh, the Rav's son and head of the Steinzelt Center in Jerusalem. <coughs> Welcome. So I got this lovely challenge to find out how often and how, what were the reason my father used to write this book and what was the premises of it. So last about a month or so since I'm preparing for this event, I went through about, I don't know, let's say 3,000, 4,000 pages of my father's manuscripts and other writings, trying to find the word soul, literally, you know, Google search, Dropbox search, everything search, whatever I can find out, how many times the word soul is actually mentioned in his text. Very little. But to my surprise, it was, you know, I thought it'd be much more. So I went, I started digging a little deeper, I went to our archive, archive is, uh, I think, not really the right description, it's a bunch of boxes been transferred from one office to another office. Right now they're laying in a shelter in our building. And uh, there's, a, there's a nice lovely envelope, of course, said not do not touch, do not open. So as the CEO, I felt the permission and I can open it, so I open it. And there's a manuscript for something my father did when he was extremely young. My father's earliest manuscript that we have thus far, and when he was 15, 1 5, he was in Yerushalayim, in Jerusalem. He learned in what we will call today modern Orthodox school, even though it wasn't, called Sefer Male, was very respected in that time. A mixture of people, a mixture of backgrounds. They learned classics, I mean, Latin. You know, all classic education. And I'm not sure in that time he was observant whatsoever, in any capacity whatsoever. However, him and his best friend, a guy named Moshe Shapira, conspire, conspire to create a secret society called the Flame of God. I'm not making this up, it's all written down. And the idea was to create a secret cells, again, it's all quotes, I can prove it, I have a text, all around the country that people will have opportunity to, that's a fascinating thing. What was bothering these young men, and about 15, is that people are docile, people are sleeping, people are, they don't care. This is 1951, right? Israel just won amazing <coughs> war, right? They just survived the Holocaust. We just had the country the first time, and he already perceived or viewed or envisioned that people are sleeping and are tired and they're not awakening enough to be attached to what they are. And therefore, he suggests to his best friend that they will create these cells all around the country in order to awaken the soul. You know, if you think about it, it's such a such an odd concept. See, you, we, we expect people with long beards, maybe short beards, whatever, people who are religious people to be involved with the soul. It's very important, the soul, it's something talking about it. It's not. It was really something that he's trying to say, and also you saw it in the video. He's trying to say the, video, the soul exists by everybody. Doesn't matter who you are, what you are, have this existence. Even though I don't know how to call it, they have many names. I mean, it depends on what tradition you come from. All of them have a different name. What is the soul? Where the soul lay? But the idea is the soul is every, everybody has one. And you have to find a way to awaken it. I found it very peculiar that his mission, that he chose, part of our motto, is let my people know. Right? This is a motto of things on all our publications, says let my people know. We believe in knowledge, believe a person need to know what is 
Judaism, a person needs to know what the texts are. It doesn't matter what form they take, if it's the actual scrolls in the beginning to modern technology, an app, or whatever it is, you need to be entitled. But really, beneath that, there was another motto, there was another line that uh, we heard in the house all the time. That was, it's better to be an apicorus, an heretic, than an ignoramus. And I think that line really come to answer the problem of the soul. When you know something, when you care about something, when something becomes part of you, it doesn't mean you have to act on it and become more observant, so to speak. But something is moving you, something become important part of your life, it become etched in your knowledge. That is the opposite from being ignoramus. It become etched in you. Today, when people face uh, it's called the modern challenge of technology, what to do with all the online apps and online text and online teaching materials? We see that the impact on kids learning th via those tools is not the same impact as when they're writing, when they're summarizing, when they're highlighting even. The impact is much less because it's not etched. That's the word they're using. It's not etched enough in their mind or in a way in their soul. So throughout his life, my father really, I don't know how much he spoke about the soul, literally the word soul, but that was the premises. The premises from age 15 was one, I need to awaken the soul. And it wasn't in his soul or my soul, the general soul. The ability, the general population had to be awakened. My father was never afraid from the, of the annihilation of the Jewish people because of outside enemy. It was never bothering him. I think he was too much of a Pollock. To, you know, we suffer, we continue suffering. Eventually we're gonna eat something. You know, it's, it's a normal practice. He was much more afraid of the annihilation of the Jewish people from the lack of knowledge, lack of understanding who we are. That was his concern. That is, that is the material that he pushed us constantly to do. Learn, learn, more learning. Mind you, I did not do any of this till age 19. Then my girlfriend came around and she told me you have to learn. But uh, you have to do that. It's an important thing. It's interesting to hear that in actually in a house, conversation about the soul actually was constantly mentioned by my mother. My mother actually even wrote a book about the topic, surprising call Shama also, called Soul also, but my mother wrote a small book, we did not publish it as of yet. It's online, if you go to our website you'll find it. Um, but my mother spoke about it all the time, and I think that it was part of the natural conversation in the house about the soul. The problem of the soul, and now I'm going to go to the second part of this, is it's very, it's always changing. My soul today, not necessarily the same soul I'm going to have tomorrow. My experiences that I'm having today, my impact my soul in such level that tomorrow will be completely different. I'm going to give a proof for that, just because I can. It's a very Jewish word, been used for a while, it's called bashert. Right, I'm sure we had it before, right? Somebody's searching all his life to find the chosen one. One he or she can live forever with. Right, that's a term, a shirt. And people are spending tons of time and effort to find what is called their twin soul, the other half. I'm sure most of us were present in weddings that in the wedding day, the wedding year, the wedding decade, Everything was smooth and perfect and amazing. And when you had a conversation about this couple, you're like, wow, they are so amazing as a couple, They're outstanding. And all of a sudden, 15 years later, 20 years later, 50 years later, you hear they're separating. You're asking yourself, I don't understand. They were bashert. This were the couple that we showed everybody. This is the couple. What happened? So the answer of it is really based on the structure and the ever-evolving changes in the soul. In the book that, have, that we have called Soul, this book, different covers of it, 
Verbe describes is using the tools that the Kabbalistic masters use to describe the soul. And one of the things describes there that the soul actually has five different levels, basic levels. The problem is, as much as you have five different levels, your spouse, your better half, whatever you want to go, also have five. And it really depends on where you are standing in that particular time. When you get married, hopefully, first time at least, it's holy, it's divine, it's amazing, usually very sweet. You're on the same level. As time goes by, there might be changes. And the changes might be that your soul go higher, or God forbid, lower, and then the other person does the same. A perfect marriage is the one that can contain this forever and stay on the same level, or in a tolerant level, that they can continue doing this. Otherwise, there's a change. One of the most peculiar, peculiar parts of this book describe a part of the neshama that called, in Hebrew, called yechida, or unity, the essence of the soul, the sparkling point of the soul, that uh, throughout centuries there are many stories about it. One of the most famous stories, a bit morbid, but it's not that bad, a famous story about Yosele the Holy Ganov. Yosele, what was his name? Joe, lived in a small village in Poland, like they always did, and he was the town thief. That's what was his job. You know, he used to go to Minion every morning, daven three times a day, and then after that, go and steal. That's what his job. It was very nice, you know, it's, 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 it's a job like anything else. Usually he was stealing horses. But that day, that particular morning, he had a rumor, and the local church, Santa Maria Satmer, as we call it, um, he had a church. In the church, he had a nice, lovely new statue of Mary, lovely, made from gold, with a little bit of sapphire. You know, it's worth a nice penny. And Yosele the Ganov went and take it. Right? And took it and stole it and sold it. And because being Yosele the Ganov probably wasn't the smartest tool in the shed, he was caught. And they gave him two options when the local police, local government caught him, that gave him two options. One was to convert, the other one was to die. It was a typical offer, I mean, nothing new. And Yosele the Ganov, the Holy Ganov, went throughout the process of being tortured and, being, you know, fingers, etc., etc. I can go up on your favorite medieval movies. And he keeps saying, my name is Yosele the Ganov, I was born a thief, I will stay a thief, but I also was born a Jew and I will die as a Jew. And eventually, they're about to execute him because he refused to convert. So that was, that's the typical story. The story usually ends here. Usually the story goes that he goes all the way in and they, they tell him, Yosele, you have one last chance. Will you convert? And he said, no, and they kill him. However, that is not the real story. The real story is that when Yosele actually is going up those steps to the execution, on the way there, the local king, pirates, whatever again, the, the term you would like to use, he sees the devotion of this man, said that's impossible, that a person with no, no any serious resources spiritually can handle such a stress and say, I'm willing to die on God's behalf. I'm willing to do the ultimate sacrifice. Therefore, I'm going to release him. So that's the story. The story goes that he's been released. So the day after he'd been released, the local Hasidim, we skip a few hundred years, more or less, the local Hasidim had a conversation with the local rabbi about what's going to happen to Yosel now that he almost died in God's holy glory. And the rebel turned to his Hasidim and said he's going to die in 48 hours. So the Hasidim was shocked. I mean, I, I, the man went through all this torture, all this suffering, all this pain, and now he's going to die? I mean, it makes absolutely no sense. This is the reward of worshiping God? So two days. After 48 hours, Yosel the Holy Ganov passed away. So they buried him, there's a big ceremony, etc., etc. 
And he came back to the Rebbe and said, Rebbe, you have to explain it. It doesn't make no sense. How can it be that someone who's willing to do all those steps will die instantly like that? It should be the opposite. It should live forever. And the Rebbe explained. The soul has four stages that are common. You have the soul that you're born with, that every part of the creation has, from rocks to humans, everything has it. That's the basic level of the soul. The second part is what we call, it's getting very confusing, these words, um, called neshama, that everybody has, a human has it. The third part is what we call its emphasis by our actions, the soul that being created by our own good deeds. The fourth stage is actually reflecting called the living soul. It's actually a soul that being awakened during two events around your life. Celebration in the family, um, holidays, maybe some of them real vacations. It's the kindle because it has the opportunity. But the fifth part of the soul, called the Yechida Shebenefesh, the singularity, the unity of the soul, that's only awakened literally once in your life. Now, because it's Kabbalah, and there are many opinions, so the one time is not one time, it's really five times. So it's when you are born, which is, you know, it can tell it's completely useless because you have nothing to do with it. It can be awakened, it can be shining, but what can I do with it? And I was born. Second time is when a person leaves this world. And in that particular moment in time, he has nothing to do with it. He has no opportunity to control this amazing energy. The third time, according to legend, according to lore, is when a person gets married the first time. Don't ask me why, but that's what tradition dictates. The first marriage even though it might not work forever, that particular marriage, that particular time, awakened that part of the soul. Therefore, we're claiming that the groom and bride in the day of their wedding, usually the first one, are like the high priest. They are pure. The fourth time, again, according to legend, is when you're 20 years old. Again, very useless because most of us did not use the time well when we were 20. And the reason is because Adam and Chava were born when they were 20 years old. See, that's information you never knew before. That will give my credit for that. And the fifth time when this soul has been awakened every year is in the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur, that particular part of the soul is awakened. But it's awakened in a very limited, contains way. It's starting in one moment, starting at the beginning of Yom Kippur, and ends in Yom Kippur. When I am, the problem what the rabbi, what the rabbi tried to explain is Hasidim, when a person is willing to do the ultimate sacrifice, he's willing to go to cross the boundaries of the body. He wants to sacrifice his soul, his essence. There's no way back. The body is no longer able to contain that spirituality. The body doesn't have the abilities, unless one has went through training, to contain it. Therefore, once the soul has been awakened in such a level, he will never go back. Now, the funniest thing is that this thing is also described in early Japanese manuscript, uh, describing sapuku, ritual suicide. <coughs> once a warrior, a warrior, samurai, was asked to step to the great void, is a description, many cases, many cases, not just one, that when actually somebody was stopped, he actually did the first step, meaning the, whatever, whatever particular thing that he used to, to kill himself, usually a katana, a sword, he used, if somebody stopped him after the first action was made, they described that particular moment as reaching the gates of heaven. Again, I'm not, familiar exactly with all the terms, but that, if you read the text, exactly the same notion. And the description of people who survived this experience always were regarded in the highest level, because they went to the world beyond and came back. 
That is the Yechida Shebenefesh. That is the eternal part of the soul. And once you tap it, it's extremely hard to get back from it. It's, it's too hard. However, throughout history, there were masters, the people who were, that was the job. There were actually people who had been trained to do this kind of things. This is usually people that you hear about in miracle stories. People who can fluctuate time, fluctuate the place where they live around. People that can bend what they are. Now, they're very unique, and some of them sound like a science fiction, the best part. But some of them have these stories about it that are going throughout centuries. And again, it doesn't want to be necessarily be Jewish. It is the stories we hear about holy people that can bend or can change or can foresee things that are not naturally there. But this is by our tradition, by, the, by Kabbalah, by mysticism, Hasidus, the idea is that somebody has to train that for a while to reach this level. It's not a natural way of thinking. <coughs> so that's the second part. The third part is that one has to start talking about the soul. These two topics that in most households people don't speak about. God, whatever you want to define he, she, it, and the soul. The conversation about God, conversation about the soul, something that we have to revive. Now, I don't have a proof that we ever did this. I mean, if you look throughout history, for our books, for our manuscripts, for our traditions, I don't think there was, if you imagine the house of Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, right? I don't think that when he spoke, actually, he did not speak to his sons, um, but presumably, Moshe Rabbeinu, when he came back to his family, he did not, hey, darling, so nice to meet you, by the way, see, I'm, I'm shining, let's talk about God. No, they probably talked about food, what the kid did today in schools, they kicked out from school again because he did not be in class, you know, these type of type, typical things. I don't know if the conversation about the soul was actually something that was vibrant and real anywhere. However, as my father predicted and envisioned in 1951, we have to realize that we head in that direction. If we're not going to talk about the soul, or in that sense about God, or about what we are and learn about the text that we have, we will end up gone. We will vanish. Now, it's not a negative thing. I'm not trying to do this as a prediction for, you know, doomsday prediction. But I think that's what he's envisioned from the beginning, was to find a way to wake up people. And he used this small book. No, you can see, I think the biggest benefit about this book, you cannot tell me it's too long. It's just not too long. It's very short. Now, the funniest thing is that this, this book originally was dictated early to to one of my father's secretaries. And the first edition of it was actually not in Hebrew, it was in French. Okay? After the French edition was done, we did the Hebrew, which went to another level of editing. After the Hebrew was done, we retranslated this book. We translate, not edited, this book three times before we got the own staff who does the Talmud and the Bible to redo this in English. So this book is really went through the mill with being exact and specific and detailed to whatever you're looking for. And it's a very short book, so you really cannot have the excuses of, oh, it's too complex, it's too long. It's a very short, sweet read. Now, it was just about this book, and again, it's it's... It's amazing to see that from the moment my father had the ability to start talking about his agenda, bringing knowledge to the world, the purpose was the soul. The purpose was to awaken it, keep it, to guard it, to make sure it's part of a conversation. And even today when I'm speaking to him about our agenda to create a, an app or create an online library, his main concern is how is that going to impact people? You know, a lot of the conversation is very hard with him because it's really a one-way conversation, but that's his response to me. So the last thing I want to talk about is before we're dealing with, you know, people actually going to teach from the text or other texts, I want to give a short synopsis of Jewish mysticism. I have five minutes. I will do it quickly. <laughs> Jewish mysticism 
take the word in the Bible, that God created man in his image, extremely seriously. The entire notion of Kabbalah, of mysticism, learns from our body. Kabbalah is based on numbers. That's mainly the, if you're really good in math, it will work very well. Kabbalah defined, they are, defined the world as that it has four parallel worlds. Our world is very practical. The world above that is the world of formation, we're just forming things. The world after that is the world of creation. The world after that is the world of nobility or holiness. And above that is God. Four worlds. The reason we have four worlds, because we have four limbs. So seriously, as, as simple as that. Two hands, two legs. Then Kabbalah talks about the ten attributes of God, the ten spherot, the basic DNA of the world, basic DNA of the creation. Those ten attributes divide to three and seven, divide to three intellectual levels, attributes, and seven emotional attributes. The reason we have ten is because we have ten fingers. That's the reason we have ten attributes. Seriously speaking, there are ten. How we know that? Because in Kabbalah and mysticism you find times when they're not actually 10, sometimes they're 11, sometimes they're 12, and sometimes they're 9. They're all interchangeable. Again, it's all introduction to the next part. The essence of Jewish mysticism is based on the Word of God in the text. Those Word of God in the text based on the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. The reason we have it's based on 22 years, letters of the alphabet is very simple, because we have 10 fingers, Ten toes, a tongue, and what well, called private parts for say conversation. It's the way we express ourselves. That's the reason I have twenty-two. It's important to remember it because when start once you start learning Jewish mysticism and really dealing with the levels of the soul, you understand that your soul is complex and someday what the, what you have, the soul you have today is really the level, let's say, of physical world. The soul you're dealing today is physical. You're dealing with the tumult, with the noise of the world today is one level. Tomorrow morning, when you might have epiphany, a spiritual epiphany, or some emotional epiphany, doesn't it be spiritual even, your soul might <clears throat> ascend to a much higher level. That's going from level one to level three. The complexity, complexities of this soul and the levels in between souls and the connection we have between people it only depends on this endless information endless numbers you ever thought about it was why don't you get along with seven people or why you do get along with whatever it can be positive things like, depend up to you but well, you do get along with some people automatically and some people you have to work very hard and some people you just cannot stand some of it is not because of you. And again, psychologists will give you demonstration on this and this and reason is because you this personality, B personality, C personality. We believe it's because of the soul. Certain soul can contain everything. Certain souls are sensitive to certain things. Certain souls can handle crudeness. Certain souls are very, very sensitive. No, my father's name is Adin, which means gentle. Some of us who got his rebukes, I'm not sure they will agree on that, but you know, it's very gentle man. <coughs> My name is Menachem, which is mean, the one who gives condolences or condoler. Again, not all my employees will agree with that, uh, but that's the way it is. And part of it is the way the soul built. And once we deal with it, once we comprehend it, that it's all interchangeable, it's all moving, not even changeable, just moving, life becomes, I think, more fascinating. Because we're trying to figure out. What do you do today? What is, the, what you, what is your search today? And how is good this particular search will move you forward, which you didn't do in the past? They, um, again, I wish you all uh, the great rest of the day. I hope you enjoyed thoroughly.